Hello, I am happy to welcome you to this part 2 of radiation protection course. In this course, we will discuss about the radiotherapy facility design and I have three lectures on it. The lecture one will be mostly a general concept for a low energy linear accelerator bunker. Lecture two, we will discuss the differences for a high energy one and lecture three will be some sample calculations and some additional information that one need will have to know for designing a radiotherapy facility. I have a disclaimer here. The discussion will be mainly on the bunker for a CM radiotherapy linear accelerator. Though I will touch upon little bit in the lecture two, the additional requirements for a tomotherapy or a cyber knife but my main focus will be on a conventional CEOM linear accelerator bunker. I refer to mainly the document provided by NCRP 151, which gives an extensive detail about the facility design for a high energy linear accelerator. It's such a large document, one would need some 10 to 15 lectures to cover the entire document in detail, which I've tried to bring it to two to three lectures. Therefore, I will not be discussing everything in detail. I would request you to refer to the document for additional details. I will only touch upon important concepts, concepts that are required for a medical physicist to learn about facility design. The scope of this lecture is to understand the room design for external beam facility, as I said, mainly for a CEOM type linear accelerator, to learn different types of barriers and barriers thickness calculation, to understand workload, occupancy factor, use factor, and much more. What are aim and scope of radiation shielding? The aim of radiation shielding is to limit the radiation exposure to members of the public and radiation workers to an acceptable level. Please note, to an acceptable level, not zero. The scope is to have a shielding design goal, which are levels of dose equivalent used in the design calculation and evaluation of barrier thickness constructed for protection of workers or members of the public. So these are the aim and scope of radiation shielding. What is the goal of radiation protection? To say that ideally the shielding design should be based on effective dose. That is the whole body effective dose. But the determination of effective dose is a complex process. If you need to calculate effective dose, you need to know the attenuation of photons and neutrons in the body. And you need to know the penetration of the radiation to the radiosensitive organs and the energy spectra of the photons and neutrons and the posture of the exposed individual with respect to the source. Only when you know all this, you will be able to calculate the effective dose. So it's a complex process. Therefore, NCRP has recommended the shielding design goals will be based on the dose equivalent and not effective dose. The next thing is, what do you call as controlled area? What are controlled areas when you, you know, there is a definition, there is a classification of controlled area and uncontrolled area as far as the radiation protection is concerned. What is a controlled area? Controlled area is a limited access area in which the occupational exposure of personal to radiation or radiosensitive material is under the supervision of a competent person, for example, a radiation safety officer. So he is in control of that area with respect to the radiation received by the individual as well as the storage of radioactive materials. He controls the access, occupancy and working conditions for radiation protection purposes. Immediate areas where radiation is used all come under this controlled area such as the control console machine room, UPS room, all these are called controlled areas. Staff in these areas are the individuals who are specifically trained in use of ionizing radiation. 
and whose radiation exposure is monitored individually for each one. Now I think you have an understanding of how do you define controlled areas. Number one, the controlled areas are where the radiation personnel are working and it is under the supervision of a radiation safety officer or it may be an area where radioactive materials are stored. The access, occupancy and working conditions are controlled for radiation protection purposes. Who can enter that area, who can occupy that area, who can work in that area, all are controlled. Which are the places, the immediate areas to the radiation facility where radiation is used. There such as the control console, machine room, UPS room, all these come under controlled areas. And the staff in these areas are individuals who are specifically trained in the use of ionizing radiation. And number two, the radiation exposure is usually monitored. What are the considerations for controlled areas as per NCRP? For recommendation of dose in controlled areas, there are two considerations. One is that annual dose limit E recommended for radiation personnel that is 50 millisievert per year with cumulative dose E not to exceed the product of 10 millisievert and the worker's age in years. The second consideration is the pregnant radiation worker who should not be exposed to levels that will result in greater than monthly equivalent dose limit of 0.5 millisievert to the worker's embryo or fetus. Therefore, in order to achieve both these recommendations, NCRP recommends a fraction of one half of that E value, that is 5 millisievert per year and a weekly shielding design goal of 0.1 millisievert dose equivalent. Please note the design goal in controlled area should not exceed 0.1 millisievert per week, mainly considering the pregnant radiation workers. What are uncontrolled areas? For radiation protection purpose, uncontrolled areas are all other areas in the hospital or clinic or and in the neighborhood to the radiation facility. The reason is the radiation workers as well as the member of the public may go to many areas in the hospital such as the examination room, restroom, waiting area and these are all considered as uncontrolled areas. Therefore, the choice of appropriate occupancy factor will ensure radiation protection of both the radiation worker as well as the member of the public. What should be the shielding design goal for uncontrolled area? We all know based on ICRP 1991 and NCRP 1993 recommendation, the do effective dose limit for public is 1 millisievert per year. Therefore, the people in uncontrolled area should not receive more than 1 millisievert a year, which when you reduce it per week will be 0.02 millisievert per week. So the dose equivalent or the shielding design goal for uncontrolled areas should be 0.02 millisievert per week, which is 1 millisievert per year. So this is the shielding design goal for uncontrolled areas. Please remember the design goal in uncontrolled area should not exceed 0.02 millisievert per week. In this slide and the next slide, we will discuss very interesting and important conservative assumptions that were normally made when you design a radiotherapy facility. And because of these conservative assumptions, the finally effective dose produced at those points will or the shielded areas will be lower than the shielding design goals that we actually set earlier. The dose effective dose of 0.1 millisievert per week for controlled areas and 0.02 millisievert per week for uncontrolled areas. It will be lower than that because of these conservative assumptions. What are these conservative assumptions? Number one, the attenuation of the beam, primary beam by the patient is not taken into account the patient could attenuate about 30% or more of the primary beam. So this is not taken into account in your calculations. Number two, the calculations of recommended barrier thickness, we assume 
a straight perpendicular radiation beam. Normally, except at the center, the beam diverges. The diverging beam will pass through a larger thickness than that is required. So this will result in more attenuation. The third assumption that we make is that the leakage radiation from radiotherapy equipment as that is recommended by the IEC, which is the maximum value recommended for radiotherapy device. In real practice, the leakage radiation is not that high. So we always assume a maximum value. The fourth point is that the suggested occupancy factor for uncontrolled areas are conservatively high as very few, few people spend 100% in that place or in that office. For example, in a waiting room, a patient will stay for very, very less time. No patient will stay the entire occupancy that is expected to be. The minimum distance to the occupied area from a barrier wall is assumed to be 0.3 meters or 30 centimeters. This is a conservatively safe estimate for most walls and mainly for the dose. Often when the data is hard to estimate or get particularly for RT facilities that are for special produce, pr procedures like TBI or radio surgery, safety factors are recommended. We will discuss that a little later. What are those safety factors? And we use the two source rule whenever we have two radiation sources. For example, you have a linear axillator with 6 mV and 15 mV or 6 mV and 10 mV. You apply the two source rule, which means you use the high energy factors for your calculation. The TVL and HVL for high energy will be always be used in a dual energy linear accelerator. Please note the minimum distance to the occupied area from a barrier wall is assumed to be 0.3 meters. Right? So when you do the survey also, you have to remember it is the 30 centimeter from the wall that is taken as the occupied area. Don't go close to the wall and say, no, it's not uh, coming correctly. So usually it is assumed as 30 centimeter from the wall or the door. Now we will move on to the factors for shielding calculation. The first factor we have to learn is the workload. Workload is the time integral of absorbed dose rate determined at the depth of maximum absorbed dose that is at one meter from the source. Usually it is one meter because we are talking about linear accelerator. If you are having cobalt, it could be 80 centimeter from the source. Okay, so please remember that. It is usually specified for a period of one week. Some also specify it per year. And the unit we use for workload is gray per week or gray per year. Suppose you need to know the workload at another point, then you apply inverse square law to know the workload at another point at a distance d2. For dual energy machines, the workload at higher energy will usually determine the shielding requirement. This is what I said in the conservative assumptions that the two, rows, two source rule that we use, the TVL and HVL for high energy will be used. While determining the shielding for photon beams, electron beam contribution could be neglected. Please remember, as I said earlier, for dual energy machines, the workload at higher energy will usually determine the shielding requirement. The value of workload, which is denoted by the letter W, is usually specified as the absorbed dose from photons delivered at the isocenter in a week and is based on the estimated use. So how many patients you will treat, how many, how much dose you will give, all this to be taken into account when you calculate the workload. Workload is usually estimated from an average number of patients. You know, it is hard to say that I'll be treating so many patients and all. Like, so it's usually taken from an average number of patients treated in a week and the absorbed dose delivered per patient or per field is taken. It should also include an estimate of the average weekly absorbed dose at isocenter due to other reasons like quality control, calibration, and other physics measurement should also be taken into account in the workload. 
How do we do that? When we, we will look at it, we will learn it when we discuss about the calculation. Use of intensity modulated radiotherapy can lead to leakage radiation workload that are greater than the total absorbed dose at the ISO center. So IMRT, if you are using for the regular workload, the dose will be the same. You will be delivering the same three gray, you know, the, maybe the same number of patients and the same number of workload uh, calculation will be there. But for leakage radiation, if you are using IMRT, the workload will be higher because the beam time on is longer. So the leakage will be much more. So the leakage workload, you have to take into account specifically the IMRT if you are using that machine for IMRT. The workload for any linear accelerator facility can be calculated. However, for convenience, NCRP has provided you some uh, values that you can assume for workload. For example, for energy less than 10 MV, you can assume a value of 1000 gray per week at 1 meter from the target. And for energy greater than 10 MV, you can assume a value of 500 gray per week at 1 meter from the target. These are the values provided by NCRP. However, it is easy to calculate if you know approximately how many patients you would be treating and then you can calculate the workload for your facility, which we will discuss in the next slide. As I said it in the previous slide, you can also calculate the workload if you have an idea about the number of patients that will be treated per day in the linear accelerator and the average dose that will be delivered per each patient. For example, if the average dose delivered by each patient is 3.3 gray and the number of patients treated per day is 50 and you do a five days per week treatment and use it for 52 weeks a year, the total clinical workload will be 42,900 gray per year at the ISO center. In addition to the clinical work, you also use the linear accelerator for calibration and physics measurement, quality assurance and electronics work, etc. This is referred to as the calibration workload. The calibration workload, you can do a safe assumption of about 15 to 20% of the clinical workload as the calibration workload. Let us assume in this case, the calibration workload is about 7,100 gray per year, which is approximately 15% of the clinical workload. Then the total workload, which is the clinical workload plus the calibration workload will be 50,000 gray per year, which is 1,000 gray per week at the ISO center. Please remember, if you're using your linear accelerator for IMRT, the IMRT workload is to be calculated separately and a factor of 10 for the leakage radiation has to be used as a safe estimate for IMRT leakage workload. The reason being, when you do IMRT, even though you deliver the same dose of 3.3 gray, the beam on time is much, much higher. Therefore, the leakage radiation from the head will be much higher and hence a factor of 10 has been recommended for leakage radiation calculation. Factors for shielding calculation, the next factor we have to learn is the use factor. Use factor is the fraction of a primary beam workload that is directed towards a given primary barrier. The value of use factor will depend on the type of radiation installation. For example, which we are discussing now is the CM linear accelerator. We'll have a symmetric distribution of gantry angles like you do zero degree, 90 degree, 45, I mean, 270 degree and 180 degree, almost equally. But if you are planning to do total body radiation and particularly with a lateral beam and with patient at an extended SSD, then the use factor for that particular wall will be much higher, particular barrier will be much higher. That you have to Calculate. But if you are doing just one TBI a week or something, it's very small factor. But if you are going to dedicate that machine for TBI, then that has to be taken into account. The other important thing is the use factor for the secondary barrier is always one. The use factor which we are discussing 
is only for the primary pair. The next is the occupancy factor. Occupancy factor for an area is the average fraction of time that maximally exposed individual is present while the beam is on. So please remember the maximally exposed person while the beam is on present at that point is referring to as the is referred to as the occupancy factor. It is the fraction of the working hours in a week that this individual would occupy the area averaged over the year. For uncontrolled area adjacent to the treatment room having an assigned occupancy factor of 1 by 40 would mean that the maximally exposed individual would spend an average of one hour a week in that area every work week for a year. So for example in an uncontrolled area you are saying 1 by 40 is the occupancy factor. What do you mean by that? When you say 1 by 40 is the occupancy factor you mean to say any maximally exposed person will stay there only for one hour in a week because it's a 40 hour week. So that is how the you know occupancy factor is calculated. Suppose the occupancy factor is one, the maximally exposed person will sit in that area for eight hours a day and 40 hours a week. So that is how the occupancy factor is calculated. The occupancy factor is not the fraction of time that is occupied by any person. This is what I wanted to do. It's not the fraction of time that is occupied by the per any person, but rather it is the fraction of the time that the area is occupied by that person spending the maximum time there. Right? So this is what I was trying to explain in the previous thing. The waiting room has a very low occupancy factor since no single person is likely to spend more than 50 hours per year in a waiting room, which means uh, one hour a week in a waiting room. The occupancy factor does not refer to the person, it refers to the area. The area being fraction of time, the area is occupied by the single person spending maximum time there. Little more on occupancy factor. Occupancy factor for controlled area is usually assigned a value of unity because you, you know that the person is always there. For example, the control room. Everybody will be sitting there all the, the control, the radiographer or the technologist will be sitting there all the time. However, there may be controlled area which is restricted even for radiation work when the radiation is being produced. That is the equipment room or UPS room, right? So this will not have an occupancy factor of one. If a clinic plans to operate equipment longer than 40 hours a week or more than 8 hours a day as it mostly happens in India, does it mean that occupancy factor will be larger than 1? No. The occupancy factor shall be determined by the ratio of the average time the maximally exposed individual will be present to the total average time that equipment is used during this week. Right? So that is how the occupancy factor is calculated. The occupancy factor shall be determined by the ratio of the average time the maximally exposed individual will be present, which cannot be more than eight hours a day. Because if you have extended working hours, you would have a shift duty. So the same person doesn't stay there for more than eight hours or more than 40 or 40 hours a week. Right? I hope I made this point clear and hope you understood that. So occupancy factor is the fraction of time a particular location is occupied. Please remember, full occupancy of controlled area is T is equal to 1 and it is denoted by the letter T. Full occupancy of uncontrolled areas T is equal to 1. That means it's full occupancy. Office, laboratory, shops, wards, nurses station, living quarters, children's play areas and occupied space in nearby building now all these are considered as full occupancy, whereas waiting room corridors can have partial occupancy. Partial occupancy for uncontrolled areas, you use 1 by 4 for corridors, restrooms, elevators, operators, unattended parking lots. And you use 1 by 16 for waiting room, toilets, stairways, unattended elevators, you know, 
outside areas used only for pedestrian or vehicle traffic. Some people even go up to 1 by 40 if you are sure that it is going to be just one hour a week that will be occupied by the maximally exposed person. There are different types of radiotherapy installations and it could have different implications. Here is a one which is the total body radiation. In TBI, the maximum field size directed on one specific primary wall or barrier is usually switched on for about 15 minutes or even more because you want to do it with a you know, low dose rate. Therefore, the use factor for that barrier can be much larger than the use factor for routine fields delivered at the patient from multiple directions. Right. So one has to be very. But if you are going to have a dedicated TBI machine, this has to be taken into account. All right. You can also argue or it could. It is also true that if you dedicate a TBI machine, not that the machine is going to be used eight hours a day or like that. You may have very less patients that it may compensate. But you have to be mindful that there will be more occupancy to that wall. There will be more occupancy to that wall or that barrier, I should say. That is the correct word I should use. Okay. Let us think of the case of IMRT. We did discuss about it a little earlier. Uh, the beam on time for IMRT could be 10 times higher. So the leakage could be much higher. The beam output isocenter would be the same because you will be still delivering maybe three gray per patient at the point of interest but the leakage radiation from the head would be much much higher because the beam on time is longer so you have to be mindful of that so if you are planning to use it for IMRT the leakage workload will have to include this IMRT factor of 10. These are the safety factors if you remember the safety assumptions when you are not able to really calculate for special procedures you put safety factors in this is one of those safety factors so imrt will have several times more leakage radiation please remember that the other type of radiotherapy installation could be uh, for stereotactic radio surgery or stereotactic body radiotherapy srs or sbrt where you deliver very high dose not three gray maybe 18 gray per patient so if you are going to dedicate that bunker, that facility for SRS or SBRT, you have to be mindful that the workload will be different. You can always argue that if I'm using for SBRT or SRS, the number of patients will not be as many as you do with conventional RT. It's true, but you have to be careful. You have to know that and you have to take that into calculation. It may come to the same value or even less, doesn't matter, but you have to know that you are using it for this and this can have some implications. So SRS and SBRT have high individual absorbed doses and delivered to patient. Therefore, both primary and secondary barrier workloads can be greater than the standard case. The other thing is for SRS, even for IMRT, you may use more multiple oblique angles than the 0, 180, 270, and 90. So the use factor could be slightly different. You know, there are some publications where they looked at the use factor for IMRT and uh, SBRT and things like that, where you do full rotation. You know, you are not only hitting at 90 degree or 270 degree, you are hitting at various angles. Right? So the 90 degree use factor will have to be slightly less because you will be hitting at 45 degree or maybe at 100, 135 degrees or something. That has to be in mind, but it it finally may work out to be the same, but you have to know that there could be a difference in the use factor. As I said in the previous slide, the actual effect of these special situations like TBI or SRS or SBRT on a weekly or yearly basis may be offset by the fact that you may not be treating as many patients like conventional. You may be treating fewer patients and may because mainly because of the prolonged setup time, 
and maybe other reasons that you may not have that many patients to treat with SBRT or TBI. So this effect could be offset by that. However, you have to be mindful of this. This is what I said. However, the clinic should carefully evaluate their anticipated weekly workload if they anticipate the use of one or more of these advanced techniques more frequently or decide to dedicate a treatment machine only for that. So if you're planning to dedicate that machine for TBI or SBRT, then you have to be mindful of this, that this special procedure can have different workload than the conventional, different leakage radiation, you know, or different use factor for that particular barrier. So you have to be mindful of those things. If you want to do a facility design, you need a lot of information to start your work. Number one, efficiency of shielding material used. What material you're going to use and what is the efficiency with reference to the beam energy, beam incident angle, you know, all those things you need. Distance to the barriers. What is the distance from the isocenter to the barrier? So that you can apply the inverse square law corrections correctly. Machine workload in each direction. Staff occupancy. Linux type and beam parameters. What are the energy? What is the maximum collimator opening? And what special techniques that Linux can perform? Whether it can do TBI, whether it can go do IMRT or SBRT. You need to know the dose limit, dose equivalent, and the quality factors. In this slide, I would like to discuss some general design considerations. First thing will be when you want to design a bunker for linear accelerator, you would like to know what should be the size of the bunker. An average size of seven meters by seven meters would be ideal for a linear accelerator with a ceiling height of three meters. However, if you're planning to do total body radiation, you need to have more than seven meter on one side of the bunker or you need to fix the isocenter off center so that you get at least a clearance of four meter to four meters to do total body radiation. If you're planning for machines like cyber knife or exact track, your ceiling height has to be larger than three meters. Particularly for cyber knife, it has to be above four meters. And if you're planning for exact track, the floor below the floor, you have to fix the x-ray tube or the detector so you have to have provision for that we actually i planned for a mr electra mr linac bunker before i retired but we didn't acquire an mr linac but i had the opportunity to design the bunker few things we had to take into consideration one is there has to be a machine room much larger machine room for mr linac outside the bunker and inside the bunker there has to be a pit of one meter below the floor level, you know, to keep the MR machine in the floor level uh, to be on line with the LENAC, a pit is required. So you should not finish the flooring and you have to have that pit ready for MR LENAC. And to take the MR LENAC into the bunker, you won't be able to take through the door because you need a minimum opening of about three meters by three meters, which is approximately 10 feet by 10 feet. So before you complete the bunker, please leave a place somewhere on sites where the MR linear can be taken in and then complete the bunker. The orientation of the LENAC is another thing. How do you want to orient the LENAC? When you orient the LENAC, what you have to consider is where the primary beam is going to hit. So the primary barrier should be built in that place, whether you have adequate space for it. You know, you can have the gantry oriented like this, as is shown here, or you can have the gantry oriented like this. You also have to look at the entrance way for the corridor. Whether, you know, if you have a larger maze, you will have less scatter reaching the entrance. That is another thing you have to look at, but we will discuss that in more detail when we discuss about the doors design for linear accelerator bunker. You also have to look at other logistics around the room, such as the trolley entry for the maze or the door of the LENAC, and also the patient waiting room. 
patient change rooms, all those will have to be decided, uh, you know, planned when you design a linear accelerator bunker. One thing is to have a controlled room in the linear accelerator. I would personally prefer to avoid the beam facing the control room, but it is absolutely fine if you have adequate shielding, you can have the control room here. I have seen linear rooms like this, though personally, I would like to orient the beams away from the control room. For shielding consideration, you have to classify the types of radiations. Number one is the primary radiation. What is primary radiation? The bremsstonum radiation from the linear accelerator. That's a primary beam that comes out of the LINAC. Then the secondary radiation. What is secondary radiation? That is the photon radiation produced by scattering of the primary radiation. There is scatter within the collimator. There is scatter from the patient. There is scatter from the wall. All these are referred to as the secondary radiation. The third one is leakage radiation. What is leakage radiation? The radiation that is transmitted through the linear accelerator head. You have good shielding, lead shielding around the head where the target is positioned, but still there will be leakage radiation from the head. And this is a good source of radiation that needs to be shielded, right? So there are three types, primary radiation, which comes from the linear accelerator through Bremsstrahlung production for radiation treatment. Secondary radiation, that is the scattered radiation from patient, collimator, and wall. Third is the leakage radiation that is transmitted through the linear accelerator head. What are primary barriers? Primary barriers are portions of the bunker walls, flow, ceiling that face the primary beam directly. For example, in this picture, this is a primary barrier and this side is primary barrier. The ceiling will be primary barrier and the floor will be a primary barrier. Primary barriers are designed to attenuate the photon beam originating from the treatment head or the treatment unit directly incident on the primary barrier. The primary barrier is also expected to adequately attenuate the dose beyond the barrier that results from the secondary products of the photon beam. For example, the scatter from the patient that also has to be attenuated by the primary barrier. And also the photoneutrons produced by the primary beam on the accelerator head and also on the barrier should also be attenuated. This is mainly in the case of high energy beams. Next thing we have to learn is the barrier transmission factor. If you want to say the barrier is adequate, that means the dose equivalent transmitted through the barrier should be lower than the shielding design goals we set initially. If you remember, we set a shielding design goal of 0.1 millisievert per week for controlled areas and 0.02 millisievert per week for uncontrolled areas the dose equivalent transmitted should be lower than the shielding design goal. To put it in another way, the ratio of the dose equivalent transmission, uh, transmitted to the shielding design goal needs to be less than or equal to one, which means the dose equivalent transmitted has to be less than the shielding design goal or at the maximum equal to the shielding design goal. The transmission factor is the fraction of the incident beam dose that transmits through the given thickness of the barrier. And it is given by the formula barrier transmission factor B primary is equal to the dose equivalent at that point. You know, applying the inverse square law correction, you can get the dose equivalent at that point divided by the workload into use factor into occupancy factor. If you look at this equation closely, the unit for dose equivalent you know is sievert per week and the unit of workload is gray per week. And we are talking about photon beams for which the quality factor is one. In principle, these two units gets canceled and therefore the barrier transmission factor is a unitless quantity. We discussed about primary barrier. Let us see how we calculate the primary barrier transmission factor. Right? Mm -hmm. 
The primary barrier transmission factor is calculated using this equation where B primary, that is the transmission factor for primary beam is equal to the dose limit, dose equivalent H, that is, it is at that point where this is that point, right? So you have to apply an inverse square law. That is that this distance is referred to as the D primary up to this 0.3 meters. This plus 0.3 divided by workload use factor and occupancy factor. What is this D primary by D0 whole square? This is usually uh, if you go through the NCRP, they don't use this D0 because the D0 is the distance from the source to the ISO center to apply the inverse square law, which is usually one meter. So when you say everything in meter, you don't need to have this. But if you're using, if you're doing a calculation for cobalt beam, this won't be one, this will be 0.8. This could be 0.8, could be one also because there are 100 centimeters cobalt machine. So it could be 0.8. So that's why we have the D0. But usually if you're doing it for LINAC, it is one. So H into D primary divided by D0 whole square, that is you are applying the inverse square law from the dose that at the ISO center to this point. So there is a reduction. Then you divide by the workload, divide by the use factor, divide by the occupancy factor. You get the primary barrier transmission factor. Right? And as I said, the workload is for gray per week. And of course, you know that D primary is the distance I said from the source to the, sorry, from the ISO center to the point three, this point from the ISO center to here and from the source to ISO center is the D zero. This is the continuation of my previous slide on barrier transmission factor. The same equation is uh, repeated here. Just to explain what is D0, which I said in the previous slide, D0 is the distance to the ISO center, which will be one meter for linear accelerator and 0.8 meters for cobalt. And the calculation of barrier thickness is obtained from this equation, where the number of 10th value layers, that is the barrier thickness is calculated in terms of 10th value layers. The number of 10th value layers is equal to inverse of barrier transmission factor to log 10 that is log 10 1 by barrier transmission factor the barrier thickness actually is equal to suppose you say you get tvls number of tvl as 5 so what you will do what you will be doing is you will take tvl 1 that is the first tenth value layer thickness plus n minus 1 that is 5 minus 1 which is 4 into TVLE which is equilibrium 10th value layer. This is how you get the actual barrier thickness in meters. This is barrier thickness in terms of TVL. You Let me say you got 5 TVL. Then the barrier thickness in meters is TVL 1 for that particular energy plus n minus 1, 5 minus 1, 4 into TVL E for the same energy. This is mainly in the case of polychromatic beams. This will not be required for monochromatic beam. For example, if you are going with cobalt, you will just say if there are 5 TVLs, you will multiply TVL into 5 to get the exact barrier thickness in meters. The TVL E comes in mainly for polychromatic beam. The, for polychromatic beam, the first tenth value layer is not equal to the second and second is not equal to the third because of beam hardening. As you keep attenuating, the beam becomes hardened and the tenth value layer thickness keeps increasing, you know, to a certain extent after, you know, maybe the second or the third. That's why they have an equilibrium tenth value layer which is probably the average of it, I assume. So the barrier thickness will be TVL1 plus N minus TVL E, where E is the equilibrium 10th value thickness. Next is what should be the width of the primary barrier? This width, I'm talking about this width. What should be this width of the primary barrier? 
the primary barrier width is determined by calculating the size of the diagonal of the largest beam for example if the linear accelerator can produce 40 by 40 at the isocenter you cannot assume 40 is the largest beam you have to take the diagonal of it so if you have 40 by 40 then the diagonal is about 56.6 centimeter that is 0.566 meter so you have to consider 0.566 meter as the largest field size at the isocenter then you have to convert that for this distance maybe apply a similar triangle principle and obtain this width of the primary barrier at this point right which is about let me say 3.5 or 4 meters from the isocenter then you have to add at least 30 centimeter to that calculation for example you calculated this to be about 3 meters then you have to add 30 centimeters here and another 30 centimeters here to include the scattered radiation so actually it will become 0.6 centimeters more than what you calculate by the maximum field size and the barrier should intercept at least 20 degree scatter from the patient you know you if you draw a 20 degree line that should include that should be included in the barrier thickness primary barrier thickness right it should include at least the 20 degree scattered radiation Here are some more points to consider for the primary barrier. If you remember, we discussed about the conservative assumptions. You know, as a conservative assumption approach, the primary barrier should be calculated for perpendicular incidence of the radiation beam for the entire width of the primary barrier and not for the divergence beam. This actually makes the divergent beam pass through a larger thickness than required, right? This we discussed earlier also. If space is a concern, the thickness of the primary barrier may be tapered due to the oblique path of the radiation, which will increase both the distance to the barrier and the effective slant thickness through the barrier. If concrete is used for primary barrier, then the photoneutrons and the neutron captured gamma rays are adequately absorbed due to high hydrogen, hydrogen content of the concrete. So that is not a problem you know that's an advantage if you're using concrete so these are some of the points that you have to note for primary barriers in the previous slide we discussed about the barrier being calculated for the perpendicular incidence we are not taking into account the divergence of the beam which is actually the oblique incidence for oblique incidence the required thickness of the barrier will be less than that obtained by calculation for example here you see this is the thickness and because of the oblique incidence theta the actual thickness that it passes through will be t is equal to t by cos theta this will depend on the angle of obliquity between the radiation beam and the normal to the barrier the barrier material the required attenuation and the energy of the radiation if the scatter is ignored then the slant thickness ts is equal to t by cos theta that's what is explained here in the diagram if the required attenuation is order of magnitude the angle of obliquity is large maybe 45 degrees the increase of concrete barrier is required this is mainly for the scattered radiation right so if the obliquity is larger than 45 degrees you may have to add 2 hvl for low energy photons and 1 hvl for high energy photons that is mainly because of the the path of the scattered radiation this obliquity comes into effect particularly in the ceiling at the maze if you look at that the radiation passes through a larger path actually so you can actually reduce the thickness here beyond the maze wall but you cannot reduce this thickness if at the maze entrance because there is no maze wall so the radiation will have to pass through a larger so you cannot reduce it there but wherever you have the maze wall because it passes through the maze wall and that too in an oblique fashion and then passes you can reduce the thickness in the ceiling 
What are secondary barriers? Secondary barriers are portions of the bunker walls, floor, ceiling that cannot be radiated by the primary beam. Right? The one that is irradiated by the primary irradiated by the primary beam is the primary barrier. Secondary barriers are the walls, floor, ceiling, which are not irradiated by the primary beam. The secondary barriers are to be designed such a way they adequately protect individuals from leakage radiation, scattered radiation from the patient, scattered radiation from the walls, and secondary radiation, that is, the photoneutrons and the neutron capture gamma rays produced in the accelerator head and in scattering throughout the room. So this is the secondary barrier. The secondary barrier, as we saw in the previous slide, looks after two few things. One is the leakage radiation from the head and scattered radiation from patient and scattered radiation from wall. There is a large difference in energy of the leakage radiation and the scattered radiation. So for which energy you will make? For leakage radiation or for scattered radiation? The compromise is here. The secondary barrier requirements of scatter or leakage radiation are typically computed separately. You compute for leakage radiation and you compute for scattered radiation separately and then compare them and arrive at the final recommended thickness. So the secondary barrier, you have to compute for scattered radiation and then you have to compute for leakage radiation because there is a big energy difference between them and then arrive at which is the correct one. You compare both and then come out with a recommended thickness. Photoneutrons and neutron capture gamma rays are concerns for secondary barrier only for high energies beyond 10 MeV, particularly when dealing with thin barriers such as the dose in maze or condits. Okay, so this is a concern, photoneutrons, but that's only for high energy. We will look at it separately. Okay. This is what I said, photoneutron and neutron capture gamma rays are of concern for secondary barriers, only for photon energies above. As we discussed earlier, you need to find out the scatter barrier thickness and leakage barrier thickness separately for secondary barriers. To determine the scatter barrier thickness, you need to find out the barrier transmission factor, which is given by this equation. That is the dose equivalent divided by alpha wt, d scatter divided by d0 whole square, d secondary divided by d0 whole square, f by f0. d scatter is the distance from the target to the scattering medium. d secondary is the distance from the scattering medium to the barrier. Alpha is the scatter fraction or fraction of the primary beam absorbed dose that scatters from the patient at a particular angle. And you can get this from the table that is provided in the NCRP. F is the field size at mid depth of the patient that is here and F0 is the average field area taken as 400 centimeter square which is which assumes that the scatter fractions are normalized to 20 by 20 centimeter square field size. As we discussed earlier we need to find out the scatter barrier thickness and the leakage barrier thickness separately. To determine the leakage barrier thickness, we need to know the leakage barrier transmission factor, that is B leak, which is given by H by 10 power minus 3 WT DL by D0 whole square. Here, H is the dose equivalent, 10 power minus 3 is the factor that arises from the assumption that only 0.1% of the useful beam is the leakage radiation. W is the workload and T is the occupancy factor. DL is the distance from the target to the barrier. In the previous slides, we learned how to determine the barrier transmission factor for scatter radiation and the barrier transmission factor for leakage radiation. Once you know the barrier transmission factor, you know how to determine the number of TVLs required for barrier thickness. The number of TVLs is equal to log 10 1 by barrier transmission factor. You can use that and find the barrier thickness for scatter radiation and for leakage radiation.
usually the scatter barrier thickness is less than the leakage barrier thickness. If the S leak minus X scatter is greater than 3 HVL, just use S leak. You don't worry about this. Use S leak thickness is more, use that. Particularly if the difference between them is more than 3 HVL. If the difference between S leak and S scatter is less than 3 HVL, add 1 HVL to account for the scatter. This is again a conservative approach. Just add 1 HVL. You can ignore S scatter for high energies. You have to go mostly by the leakage barrier thickness rather than the scatter barrier thickness. The next most important thing about facility design for a bunker is to determine how to do the doors and mazes. Entryways to linear accelerator rooms usually have a maze design, which depends on the scattering properties of the radiation. One would prefer to keep the door as light as possible. I would prefer a doorless bunker, right? Maze design for low energy, less than 10 MV, and for high energy greater than 10 MV are dealt differently as there are major differences in the secondary radiation types and fluences produced between low and high energy beams. So they are dealt very differently. At the maze and at the door, you won't have primary beam. Normally the bunker is built such that there is no primary beam there. You have to worry only about the scatter components. The maze and door shielding calculation are usually separated like this, one for low energy photons of less than or equal to 10 MV, one for high energy photon are greater than 10 MV. The dose equivalent per beak at the door is due to a few things. You have to calculate each one separately. The first, the scatter of the primary beam from the room surfaces, that is the H scatter, that what comes here gets scattered here and go goes here. So when you calculate the dough thickness, you have to take into account. Head leakage photons scattered by the room. The leakage radiation from this head also gets scattered, right? Not only the primary, the head leakage also gets scattered. So that is the head leakage scatter. The primary beam scattered by the patient and that also goes, gets scattered here and then gets scattered here and then comes here. Leakage radiation which is transmitted through the inner maze wall. So this is a head leakage that comes straight here through the inner maze wall. So all these will have to be taken into account when you do that. That is the HS, HLS, HPS and HLT. Right? You have to calculate each one and then sum it. Let us now look at the dose at the maze due to the patient scatter which is HPS the dose at the maze due to patient scatter HPS and this is given by this equation HPS is equal to A theta W U G F by 400 alpha 1 A1 divided by D scatter D secondary D Z whole square. Let us look at what each one is. A theta is the patient scatter fraction at an angle theta. So this is A theta is the patient scatter fraction. W is the workload for the primary beam. You know that gray per week. UG is the use factor for this wall because most of the scatter come from this wall. This is the wall G. And what is the use factor on this? Alpha 1 is the first reflection coefficient at wall G for the patient scattered radiation. So alpha 1 is the first reflection coefficient, which again you have to take from the table. A theta also has to take from the table. A1 is the area of the base back wall, which actually reflects. This is the maze back wall, which actually reflects the radiation. F is the field size at one meter from patient. D scatter is the distance from the target to the patient. We have discussed that earlier also. D secondary is the distance from the patient to the wall G at the maze center line. Somewhere here, where is the maze center line? You take this distance. DZZ is the distance along the maze center to the door, from the maze wall to the door. So this you have to calculate using this, the HPS, the patient scatter dose at the maze, right? 
To determine the dose equivalent due to the wall scatter, you use the formula H is equal to A0 WUG capital A0 alpha Z AZ divided by DH DR DZ whole square. W is the workload, UG is the use factor for this wall G where the reflection happens. Alpha 0 is the first reflection coefficient at surface A0. A0 is the beam area at the first reflection surface. What is the beam area? And alpha Z is the second reflection coefficient at surface AZ. And usually a energy of 0.5 MeV is assumed here. The AZ is the cross-section area of inner maze entry projected onto the maze from the perspective of this scattering area, that is the A0. From this perspective, what is the projected scattering area, right? That is AZ. And DH is perpendicular distance from the target to the first reflection point, which is denoted as DPP here. DR is the distance from the beam center to the first reflection, at first reflection, to the point B in the midline of the maze. So this is the point B. So this distance is the DR. And DZ is the center line distance from point B to the door. So the dose at door due to scatter is determined using this formula. Right? To determine the scattered head leakage component, that is the scattered dose from the head leakage, you have to use this equation. HLS, that is the dose equivalent per week at maze door due to single scattered head leakage radiation is given by LF WL UG A0 alpha 1 A1 divided by D secondary DZZ whole square. LF is the head leakage radiation ratio at 1 meter from the target, which is 0.1% as per the IEC requirement. WL is the workload for leakage radiation. UG is the use factor for the wall G. Please remember, all these calculations are done assuming the radiation is directed towards the wall G. A1 is the area of wall G that can be seen from the maze door, and this is the area. D sec is the distance from the target to the maze center line at wall G. So this is the D secondary. And D Z Z is the center line distance along the base. That is from here to the door. This is D Z Z. One of the major contributors of the dose at this point at the door is the leakage radiation that is transmitted through this wall. And this can be calculated using this formula. H L T is equal to L F W L U G B divided by D L whole square. Whereas H L T is the dose equivalent per week at maze dose due to head leakage radiation transmitted through this wall here. L F here is, as we saw earlier, is the ratio, which is 10 power minus 3 ratio of leakage radiation. WL is the workload for leakage radiation. UG is the use factor for gantry orientation. B is the transmission through this wall, transmission factor through, through this wall. And DL is the distance from the source to the door, this distance. So using this, you can calculate HLT. Once you have done the calculation of all the scatter contribution like HS, HLS, HPS, HLT, you need to sum all those to get the total dose equivalent at the maze door. But please remember, we did this with the beam directed towards wall G. So the total dose equivalent at the maze door you get is only when the beam is directed at wall G. Please remember that. Okay. And here you have a factor F which you know is used to multiply the wall scatter hs this factor f is the fraction of the primary beam transmitted through the patient and it is approximately 0.25 or 6 to 10 mv photon beams for the largest field size with the large scattering medium right like a large phantom as i said earlier all these calculations were when the beam was aimed at wall g please note the beam could be aimed at the ceiling or the floor 
or the other direction like 270 degree so the beam could be either 0 90 180 or 270 therefore to take into account the workload for all the other directions this hg is multiplied by a factor 2.64 so the total dose equivalent at the mace dose will actually be 2.64 hg and the quality factor of unity is usually assumed for photon beams of energy less than 10 mb and the maze is designed to ensure more than one scatter event please remember more the scatter the lesser the dose at the door so it is good to have multiple scatter before the radiation reaches the door if the radiation undergoes multiple scatter at the maze the energy of the beam at the door will be approximately 200 kV for which you will need maximum of 3 mm lead should be adequate right the next question is is it possible to have a doorless bunker i would prefer to have a doorless bunker let us maybe we will see in the next uh, lecture or the one after that how is it possible to have doorless bunker if at all it is possible the other thing you have to be careful when you design a bunker is the joints and conduits particularly when you use different protective materials for example you decide to use lead and uh, steel along with concrete you should make sure there is no gap between the joining points right however close you keep there will be leakage radiation so the only good way to do it the lead or steel barrier need to extend into the adjacent concrete barrier it was get embedded like it should go into it it should overlap into the concrete to avoid any leakage radiation conduits for ventilation or air conditioning preferably should have a baffle you know you can see this is the baffle and when you have a baffle to compensate for this gap you should have a lead shielding you can use concrete but the concrete will be thicker so normally people use lead but if you have if it is for high energy then it is better to use bpa which is the borated polyethylene to absorb the neutrons alternatively conduits can be slanted to about 20 to 45 degree so this is other way mean mostly in india most of the bunkers have conduits like this the conduit shall not pass through the barrier in line with the useful beam you cannot keep the conduit like this then the primary beam will you know go out through the concrete that's not allowed and you should keep it in the direction that the primary beam cannot pass through that and it should be always on the secondary wall these are the requirements for conduit the other thing you have to note in designing a bunker is positioning the lasers in the bunker you can keep the lasers on the walls on the barriers but that gives a chance for people to touch the laser i remember we had a beta tron uh, bunker which was later used for a linear accelerator so and the concrete walls we couldn't break at those, those days so we decided to place the lasers on the concrete wall and somebody touches it the laser alignment goes off frequently we had to keep aligning it again and again subsequently when new bunkers were built we decided we will keep the laser embedded into the bunker that is a good idea so that nobody touches the laser and the laser position doesn't change but when you keep it in embedded into the wall you are removing some concrete that is some shielding material is compensate you know is removed to keep the lasers that will reduce the shielding thickness in order to compensate for this you can keep a lead sheet or a metal sheet behind the laser this sheet can also form the base to position the laser on the wall so that is also an idea thank you very much for your listening as i said i have looked into ncrp 51 151 totally of course some from jake van dyke's book and iaa notes thank you very much